Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, first off, for your patience. Uh, I know it's been a long time. This was um, quite an unusual general council. We had more than 80 delegations take the floor, uh, most of them to, uh, well, all of them, to express their uh, very uh, enthusiastic support for our new director general. So let me begin right now and just say good evening to you all and welcome to this virtual press conference with director general designate Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iweala. Uh, Dr. Ngozi and I have just left the General Council, the very long General Council, where WTO members have agreed by consensus on her selection as this organization's seventh Director General. Her term, which is renewable, will start on the 1st of March and will run until the 31st of August, 2025. Her statement, which she gave to the council, will be available very soon on the WTO website. Before I give the floor to Dr. Ngozi, I have some housekeeping remarks. We are using the Zoom platform, and if you would like to ask a question, you may do so either by raising your hand virtually or through a written question submitted with the Q&A feature. You will find these icons at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Ngozi will have a brief opening statement, and then we will take your questions. We'll have about one hour. And now it is with great pleasure that I give the floor to our next Director General, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwela. Dr. Ngozi, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, Keith, and uh, good day to everyone wherever you are around the world. Um, I want to thank you for, for being here. I, Keith has set the stage, but let me say that a few short minutes ago, the General Counsel of the WTO agreed by consensus on my selection as the seventh Director General of this organization. I'm deeply honored and I'm humbled by the support I've received from WTO members. I will say that it's both exciting and uh, daunting at the same time, uh, to be here because I take the reins of the WTO at a time of great uncertainty and, and challenge. Uh, we have the twin shocks of the uh, pandemic, the health side and the economic side, which is challenging so many, uh, in, from, in, including challenging livelihoods around the world. And it has wrought economic devastation in many parts of the world. So the WTO uh, is at this point in time is also facing so many challenges. And it's clear to me that uh, deep and wide ranging reforms are needed. And as I said before, it cannot be business as usual at the WTO. We need to look at uh, the priorities uh, uh, and I'll speak to them in a moment. Uh, our priorities, the need to modernize our rules, we, we need to look at what the WTO can contribute to solve the present situation of the pandemic. We need to look at our procedures uh, so, and parts of the institution. So much needs to be done. That is why I talk about deep and wide ranging reforms. But of course, it will not be easy uh, because we also have the issue of uh, lack of trust among members, which has built up over time, both uh, 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 among not just US and China or US and EU, as many people uh, want to say, but also between developing and developed country members. And we need to work through that if we are to achieve the reforms that the WTO need, needs to achieve in order to be relevant in this, uh, in this modern, modern age. Uh, trade is very important. I mean, trade is, makes up 60% of GDP. It's grown by thousands of per percentage points over time. And it's very important if we are also to come out of this pandemic, both in terms of helping make sure there's a freer flow of medical goods and supplies to deal with the public health emergency, but also for the economic uh, revival and, and sustainability recovery uh, of, of the globe. Without uh, trade, it cannot happen. Of course, GDP growth uh, makes uh, contributes to trade, but also uh, looking at some trade rules and, and liberalization of trade can also contribute to faster uh, GDP growth. So I think trade is very, very important from all sides. And um, when we look at uh, the membership of the WTO, we must be mindful that whatever we do uh, will benefit all members, 
not just big members or middle-sized ones, but also small ones and small island economies. I think this is very important. Now, let me speak very quickly to some of the priorities that as I see them that I shared with the general counsel. I think first and foremost, we need to focus on the issue of COVID-19 and what can the WTO do to contribute to solutions. It needs to work with the WHO, with the COVAX facility, uh, with the ACT Accelerator, all these organizations that are trying to accelerate supplies and vaccines to poor countries. The WTO, one, can look at export restrictions and prohibitions from members. Uh, the, the, the International Trade Center uh, says there are almost still 100 members who have these restrictions and prohibitions. How can we lift them um, and, and be very transparent about them, making them temporary so that there'll be a freer flow of goods? Um, secondly, how can we also encourage uh, um, finding what I call a third way in which vaccines can be manufactured in many more countries whilst taking care that we don't discourage research and innovation, which is linked to inter intellectual property rights. So this is an area of work. Then we, we have the, the, the issue of the dispute settlement system, which is people call the jewel in the crown of the WTO. There's no point really agreeing on more rules. We're the very and only place in the world where mm, countries can bring trade disputes does not work, it's paralyzed. So it's a priority to really reform that and take account of the, the um, inputs of all members to make sure we come up with a dispute settlement system that works for all. Uh, there's the need to uh, modernize the rules of the WTO and bring them up to 21st century issues. What do I mean by that? We have to look at uh, the digital economy, which has become so prominent during this pandemic. Uh, E-commerce is key and is going to grow in leaps and bounds as we move on. How do the WTO does not presently have rules uh, that, that underpin e-commerce. So how to uh, put those rules in place, com complete the negotiations um, will be very, very uh, important. Uh, Dito, there are other types of negotiations on investment facilitation, domestic uh, services regulation, et cetera. These all need to be looked at. And we have a good chance of trying to come to grips with some of them. I must mention the fishery subsidies negotiation, which is key. Actually, that is uh, perhaps one of the furthest advanced uh, as of now. And it speaks to both sustainability of our oceans. It helps fulfill one of the SDGs. And there's a good chance that at MC12, which is a top, top priority for, for all the members, how do we have a ministerial, the next ministerial 12 that is successful? It provides the venue to conclude on some of these issues I've talked about, agreeing about how to solve the pandemic, even set a framework for future pandemics, agreeing, on you know uh, the fisheries subsidies negotiations, wrapping that up and, and the various other negotiations I mentioned. I forgot uh, there's one thing that is very important as a priority to me is also the fact that e-commerce will help us be more inclusive of women and mismis, micro, medium and small enterprises. Trade is about people. And uh, we have to constantly keep that in front of us. How do we bring those who have been excluded or marginalized, like women, like uh, owners of medium, micro, medium, and small enterprises into the mainstream? This is also important. And then let me just uh, mention quickly traditional issues like agriculture should not be forgotten, issues of industrial subsidies, agricultural subsidies, special and differential treatment. These are all very difficult areas that perhaps down the line we will need, uh, we'll definitely need to, to look into, not perhaps we'll need to look into them. And then there are also procedural issues. Uh, the way that they, uh, the, the bodies of the WTO work to make them much more efficient. I've said in my speech that uh, we need to look at procedures for appointing DG, DD, for appointing directors generals. I think I, I'm in a good uh, shape having just been named to talk a little <laughs> bit and, and suggest that. Uh, issues of how we make sure consensus does not stand in the way of innovations at the organization and so on. So a lot to do, uh, but these were some of the things I pointed out uh, as priority areas. So let me 
stop it there. I, I should also perhaps end by saying strengthening of the secretariat. The secretariat of the WTO has very talented staff, among the best you can find in the world on trade. So how do we help them to work better and support members better? These are some of the things that I think we should be looking at. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ngozi. Let me take a text question. The first question, it comes from Sherwin Bryce Pease from the South African Broadcasting Corporation. And the question is, what additional weight or responsibility do you feel coming into this position as the first woman and first African to ever hold the position of DG? And can you describe what emotions you felt when the US administration of former President Donald Trump sought to block your appointment despite the clear mandate you enjoyed from the majority of members? Well, in two parts. If, if I take the last latter part first, because it happened earlier, I, I think I was quite surprised when that came uh, at the decision-making meeting, uh, because there, there had been no indication previously that there was any problem with the US. I'd had two very good interviews uh, with the authorities. Uh, uh, in the administration, um, but so it was a surprise. Um, but you know, that's the way life works. And when things happen, you take them in your stride and you move on. And so it was absolutely wonderful when the Biden administration, Biden-Harris administration came in and uh, broke uh, that logjam, joined the consensus and, uh, and, and gave me such a strong endorsement, a strong endorsement to my candidacy. Um, so that, that, that has set a very good stage. And to join the other 163 members uh, to, to, to endorse the candidacy, I think is, is, uh, is wonderful. With respect to what do I feel, I absolutely do feel an additional burden. I can't lie about that. Being the first woman and the first African means that one really has to perform. I've always said these are wonderful things. It's groundbreaking. Uh, all credit to members for electing me and making that history. But the bottom line is that if I want to really make Africa and women proud, I have to produce results. And that's where my mind is at now. How do we work together with members to get results? Okay, very good. Let's give the floor now to uh, Obina Chima from This Day in Nigeria. Um Yes, you're in. We can hear you. She there? No. Okay, let's let's come back to her and let's go to uh, Larry Elliott from uh -huh. the Guardian in London. Larry, you have the floor, please. Larry there? Do you have your, you have to turn your mic on, Larry. I, I have done, I, I think. Oh, well, there you go, we hear you, we got you, okay. go ahead. Okay. Uh, congratulations, Madam Ngozi, on your new part, on your new post. You've got uh, quite a big agenda there. Just two quick questions, if I, if I can. One, you, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, how do you propose to set about breaking the logjam in the dispute settlements mechanism row. That is, that is key to getting the WTO up and, up and running again. Uh, secondly, 20 years ago this year, the WTO started a development round of trade negotiations, which was never really completed. What, if anything, can you do to revive that and to give to developing countries the sense that the WTO is something that delivers for them? Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so with respect to uh, the logjam in dispute settlement, um, Larry, you're absolutely correct. This is vitally important. Um, as I said before, this is really the key jewel in the crown of the WTO, because it's the only place in the world that countries can bring uh, trade disputes uh, that they have with each other. So it's imperative. How do we go about it? I think the one good thing that I, I would tell you is that every member agrees that the dispute settlement system needs reform. 
So that's already a good starting basis from developing to developed countries to the United States, to China, India, uh, EU, everyone agrees. So I think what we need to do, but they have various opinions about what types of reforms are needed. So well, how I would set about it is to first try to work with members to tease out what their issues are with respect to the dispute settlement system. What are those reforms? What are the challenges they see? And what are those reforms they would like to see? Of course, there have been some proposals in the past, some uh, look at this by Ambassador Walker, and I said in my speech, perhaps some of those proposals could be ones that we would uh, build on with respect to the appellate body. I think that's where most of the questions arise. So I would flesh out the reforms that are, try to systematize them and pull them together, get members to agree on this. And once they agree that these are the set of reforms, we put together a work program to implement those reforms. And I hope we can take this to the ministerial 12, which is uh, estimated to take place by the end of the year. So we have a few months to try to work this. And then I think it will take some time uh, to really work it all out, but at least we should get a good start uh, before the ministerial. The second issue is the development round. Yes, I think the fact that the development round and Doha was never completed is also a little bit at the bottom of the lack of trust between develop and develop, developing and developed countries because the developing countries perhaps feel that this was for them and it was never completed. I think what we need to do is uh, to look at possible, there were some possible areas where progress could still be made with respect to agricultural issues. Uh, for instance, um, public stockholding for food security, coming to agreement on that, issues of how to deal with cotton. Uh, you know, so there are a few issues that I think can be picked up that, that are of concern to developing countries and we can work on those under the agricultural mandate. Very good. So uh, Obina Chima from this day has sent his question in a text form. And the question, Dr. Ngozi, is what form of support should African countries expect from your leadership in advancing the um, African Continental Free Trade Agreement um, during your mandate? Well, th thank you very much uh, for that, Obina. It's a very important question. Of course, you know, as, a, as a DG, I'm the DG for all members and must work to advance the interests of every single member. But that being said, Africa is at a unique juncture where it's, it's agreed one of the largest, uh, it has, uh, imp it's implementing one of the largest free trade agreements uh, in the world. And it has a long-term vision uh, of perhaps having a, a complete free trade area on the continent. And so the issue is, uh, what are the sticking points? Where can the WTO be useful? Well, I, 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 I want to say immediately that the WTO rules and the WTO institution has been an inspiration for the design of part of the, of the uh, African Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement. Uh, so the WTO has al already lent its body of institutional knowledge and wisdom to help design this. But building on that, we need to see what are the capacity constraints in implementing this? Can we use aid for trade to support the, the secretariat of, uh, of the AFC FTA? Uh, can we find uh, you know, technical assistance where it's needed to help break any log jams? The second way is in the, the, the WTO is working on an investment facilitation uh, uh, agreement. I think working, pushing that hard and trying to see how we get investment into the continent will be very important and we'll do absolutely everything to try and facilitate that. The continent also must do its part to make conditions hospitable uh, for investment to come in. But, I think, for example, if you look at the area of pharmaceutical products, we import more than 90% of the pharmaceuticals we use on the continent. So how can we help facilitate investment so that uh, we can have on the continent the ability to manufacture more of our medical uh, products uh, and commodities? Uh, and the WTO looking at what we can do on the investment side will be uh, uh, very, very important. Working with other organizations in partnership like the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, the World Bank, and so on. 
Very good. I have a question from Hannah Monikin from Inside US Trade. She says that you talked about your initial priorities, but what will be your first actions upon taking up your duties on the 1st of March? And how do you plan to use the political momentum of your appointment in the near term? Well, as soon as I get to Geneva in a couple of weeks, my first action will absolutely be to meet with uh, all the ambassadors, um, start meeting with them, you know, because if we are going to move fishery subsidies, I need to talk to Ambassador Santiago Wills to find out what are the sticking points and who, which delegation needs to be, you know, talked to and where can I help to move that forward? So I meet with the ambassadors to flesh out what is blocking some of the e issues. In fact, you know, there's also the possibility to get an agreement on exempting the World Food Program, for instance, from export restrictions. We are almost there, but there are issues with a couple of uh, members. And so I would like to visit them to find out what these and how we can move to have that uh, uh, cleared away and have that be a, a success. So that's uh, my main priority is to make those uh, political visits. Then of course, I want to speak to the staff. I'd like to have a town hall at some stage to thank the DDGs, the Deputy Directors General have been doing a great job in running the place. Thank them, meet with them, you know, and have a handover and I mean, a uh, uh, transition meeting with them so that uh, whilst they are still there, they can help me to get to grips with some of the important things at the Secretariat. So that will be my first. Then shortly after that, I'm going to focus in on MC12 because this is so crucial. We don't have much time to plan the next ministerial. And that ministerial, we have to have several deliverables. So I want to start looking at that right away. Very good. The next question is for uh, Xin Ling of Xinhua. Ling, you have the floor, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yes. you fine, thanks. Great, uh, thank you. Um, Xin from Xinhua News Agency. Congratulations, Dr. Gongsi, on your appointment. Um, you've mentioned this issue already in your statement, but I wonder if you want to elaborate more on it. The COVID-19 is a stress test to many governments, but it can also be an opportunity for the WTO to prove its relevance to the 21st century realities. Dr. Gongsi, you were the chair of board of Gavi. I wonder if you have any concrete plan on how the WTO will contribute to the fighting against the pandemic in a more proactive way, especially against the, the so-called vaccine nationalism to ensure uh, the free flow of vaccines across countries and their equitable distribution. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Very important question. Yes, absolutely. A top priority. I actually think that the COVID-19 is an opportunity for the WTO to have a success and show what it can do both in the short term and the long term. In the short term, I, I, I want to uh, look with staff at the monitoring function to see how many countries still have export restrictions and prohibitions that impact on medical uh, commodities. Um, uh, and, and um, look at those and see how the rules, you know, we have rules at the WTO that say, look, if you want to have these restrictions, you have to notify, you have to be transparent and you have to declare the period when you phase them out because they can only be temporary. So we'll, this will be a top priority to see how we can encourage the lifting of those uh, um, by looking at what the monitoring function is showing us and then encouraging countries to do that. That would mean a freer flow of those commodities. Secondly, with respect to vaccines, I've said that vaccine nationalism does not pay. I know that, you know, I've been, I've been in politics in my country, I've been a minister. So when this kind of thing happens, it's very natural for leaders and politicians to want to take care of their own population. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem we do have is that the pandemic is a problem of the global commons. So taking care of your population and being nationalistic with respect to vaccines won't work this time. Because even if you get all of them vaccinated and there's a country down the road that hasn't done that, the, the, it will come back in the way of variants. So one of the things that uh, one would like to do is to work very hard to see on what the WTO can do with the, under the TRIPS agreement. 
to, to use all the flexibilities possible to allow uh, countries to manufacture the uh, available vaccines so that there can be more for poor countries quickly. And this will be a, a great support to the COVAX facility, which Gavi and the WHO have put together. Actually, the WHO, Gavi and CEPI have put together what is called the ACT Accelerator, which I mentioned in my speech, designed to speed up availability of all these things to poor countries. So um, how can WTO support that by uh, uh, by uh, exercising, members exercising these flexibilities. And we see an example, I mentioned it in my speech, AstraZeneca is already licensing the production, not contracting, licensing the production of its vaccines all around the world in many developing countries. The biggest facility is in India, the Serum Institute of India in which it can produce a billion doses of uh, vaccines. So more of those, um, approaches, which I call the third way. I think that's what we need to focus on. And that's WTO can act actively encourage and support. This is a, a quite a specific question along these same lines from Giorgio Leali of Politico. And that question is, what as you, a US Director General, what role do you play in trying to find consensus between WTO members on the issue of protection of intellectual property rights while you increase the supply of uh, coronavirus vaccines. And he says, thanks and congratulations. Well, thank you so much. I want to be very proactive. I, I wouldn't uh, stop be shy in, in saying that because I think this issue is an issue of lives. We are losing lives in all countries all over the world, but in poor countries, uh, if we don't act, more lives will be lost. So um, what I'm going to try to do is to meet with members on all sides who are having these arguments about intellectual property issues and try to see if we can find, uh, 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 again, I come back, I've named it the third way, simply because I think we can find a way to be very, very conscious that we need to encourage uh, research and development, because if you don't, then we wouldn't have more investment even into looking at the variants of this. So, but I feel there's a way to do that. And at the same time, allow uh, greater manufacture. And that's what I referred to in the last one, the licensing. I mean, the interesting thing is the pharmaceuticals have, uh, uh, companies are already ahead of us. So I think we should just look at what they're doing and support them to do it with our rules. And if we exercise the necessary flexibilities under the TRIPS agreement, we can do that. Okay. Uh, nous avons une question de Laurent Sierro de l'agence, uh, the Swiss News Agency. Et uh, Laurent, vous avez la parole. Allez-y, s'il vous plaît. Thanks, Keith. Uh, and it's good to, to see you in, uh, in good health. And congratulations, uh, Dr. Ngozi, for your appointment. Actually, it's a follow-up to the to, to the previous questions on intellectual property because you mentioned the TRIP uh, the pre TRIPS agreement, but there is also on the table a proposal for waivers uh, to uh, uh, IP for um, therapeutics and diagnostics and vaccines. So, does that mean you didn't mention that one so far? Does that mean that as the new DG, you won't give so much impulsion to? to try to tackle the deadlock uh, between members on that, on that proposition. Thank you. No, merci, uh, Laurent. Um, no, on the contrary, I'm saying it will be a top priority for me. But what I'm saying is that instead of the arguments and the deadlock, we can actually break the deadlock. And I'm hoping that I will engage on this as quickly as possible. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I would like to sit with the members on each side and, and be able to listen to what they have to say and find a way to persuade them to come to agreement. What I was saying is that, look, under the TRIPS agreement, perhaps we can find sufficient flexibility. What, what, what developing countries are looking for is how can they get access to these products quickly and at an affordable price so that poor countries are not standing in line like they did with H1N1, where rich countries bought up all the vaccines and there were none 
or you know, for any other where the poor countries HIV drugs in the past, where they stood in line for a few years. That's the objective. If we all agree on the objective, I think that's the important thing. The object, if the objective is agreeable and acceptable, that poor countries should not wait in line and wait long to get access because it's not even in, in the interest of rich countries. Then we can try to figure out a way to do this. And I'm saying that I would like to be able to broker you know, this uh, uh, by listening to both sides, what I call a third way in which without uh, impinging on intellectual property, looking at the flexibilities that are available, which I think will allow us to manufacture and produce those uh, the, the vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics. Uh, by working with the manufacturers of these, the pharmaceutical companies. I think we can do it. Very good. So the next question is for Mikako Yokoyama from Mainichi Newspapers. Uh, Mikako, you have the floor, please. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Uh, Dr. Negoshi, congratulations uh, for yeah. your appointment. And I have two questions. Uh, my my first question is some people worry, worry that you don't have enough experience of international trade. So what do you think about that claim? And do you have any idea? And my second question is currently WTO is working not well. So many countries are focusing on regional trade agreement like CPTTP or RCEP. So what is the rule of WTO? And could you tell me why you think WTO is necessary? Thank you. Okay, thank you, two, two very good questions. Thank you so much. With regard to the worry uh, um, or the issue of trade experience, um, I, I don't think we should uh, spend a long time on that. I mean, uh, 162 countries prior to the blockage uh, from the uh, Trump administration, uh, 162 countries felt I had enough experience uh, to, to win the consensus. So I think that's the key. Um, uh, I, I, my background speaks for itself. I've been working in the area of trade. As a Minister of Finance, trade facilitation and customs reported to me. The, I was coordinating Minister of the Economy in, in Nigeria as well as Minister of Finance, and I coordinated all the uh, economic ministries, including trade. So I think somewhere perhaps someone got the wrong impression. Um, so that is not a key issue for me. And um, if it is about trade negotiations, I'm not a negotiator, but I don't think that's what the WTO needs right now. If it were just skills for trade negotiations only, all the problems would have been solved because Geneva has no shortage of those skills, either within the secretariat or among ambassadors. They've been there and the problems have not been solved. So I think those who are saying this need to look at what is the situation, what's the problem and what does it need? What it needs is someone who has the capability to drive reforms, who knows trade and who does not want to see business as usual. And, and that is me. Now on the issue of WTO not working so well and the regional um, trade agreements, you're right that uh, because the rule book of the WTO uh, is not up, keeping up to date, regional trade agreements, bilateral agreements have you know, proliferated. Um, uh, and and uh, actually some of them have more innovations than we have at the WTO. But there's one important thing. Uh, the WTO is the only multilateral venue where every member can come together and it is far more cost effective. Economies are there, economies of scale in having multilateral agreements than bilateral and regional. So I'm not saying those are not important, they are, but I think the WTO one, the monitoring function is very important. So it can monitor not just a group of countries or, but all countries. Uh, multilateral negotiations are very important as, you, as you've seen for yourself, just that the WTO has not been able to have any, and we are going to have the fishery subsidies as one that will hopefully come in. And, uh, and uh, the WTO has the only place where countries' members can bring their trade disputes 
so, so it's the only place in the world, and that is a very important function. That's why we need to reform the, the dispute set settlement mechanism. So all in all, the WTO has been of utmost benefit to its members, including the big and rich countries over time, because it has ensured fair, transparent rules of the game and a level playing field for the multilateral trading system. That is still needed today. And that's why the WTO is extremely important to underpin that fair, balanced, transparent trading system. Okay, very good. Let's take a written question. This one is from Anna Swanson from the New York Times. And picking up on the question you've just answered, what do you see as the path forward for reforming the appellate body? Thank you. Um, I think that the reform of the appellate body will, is not going to be um, um, uh, an easy one. Um, but there have been specific criticisms of the appellate body. Um, it, it looks to me like the work done by Ambassador Walker and all show that the majority of members would like to see a two-step dispute settlement mechanism, including the appellate body. But we need to talk to our members to make sure this is still the case. That being said, there were specific criticisms of the appellate body, uh, you know, overreaching the mandate that was agreed to by members, uh, you know, kind of going to jurisprudence, you know, by, um, you know, trying to, it's supposed to settle disputes among members. So um, case law and all that is not what it's supposed to be about. And there are so accusations or criticisms that it's doing that. And that goes beyond the mandate that members signed on to. So that's a very specific uh, uh, criticism that uh, I think is valid. Then the, the time taken um, to reach agreements was supposed to be 90 days. And now you have sometimes cases that go on for two years and so on and so forth. Now, we have to be fair. Cases today are much more complex than they were in the past. So that may account for some of the reason it's been taking so much more time. But we need to look at that. There is no reason why we can't come to a situation where the norm becomes to go back to the 90-day period and render these uh, cases, the solutions, uh, or, or, or the agreements on what to, how to solve them faster within those periods. So I'm just giving you two instances of criticisms, very specific, which I think can be dealt with. So my, the path forward is to surface those criticisms, to try to um, uh, tackle them by eliciting the solutions that all members want. And then finally to come with an appellate body that uh, has the confidence of all. Very good. Let's now take a question from the floor from Agnès Podrero. Agnès, vous avez la parole, s'il vous plaît. Allez-y. Yes, uh, good evening, everybody, and congratulations uh, to you, uh, Dr. Ngozi Okoncho Iweala. Uh, I have uh, just two questions. First question is really uh, a very small one. I wanted to know how you want us that we call you, uh, because we have heard from <laughs> Dr. Ngozi, Dr. Konjoiwala, so what is the best way for us? Uh, to I think you should just call me Dr. Ngozi. Okay, perfect, <laughs> thank you. And the question would be then, um, you, you have a, lead, a very long list of uh, priorities and things that you want to, to change or to, to work at WTO. Uh, of all that list, what would be your priorities for the first uh, 100 uh, days of your uh, uh, post? Thank you. Thank you. Um, the priorities would be one, working on solutions to the COVID-19 pandemic. What can the WTO bring to help solve problems? And I've talked extensively about the ways it can help solve that, not only on the health side, but also the economic side. I mean, you know, looking at uh, trade and how to further liberalize and get trade going uh, will help the world economy to, to, to also bounce back further. So it can play a role on, on the health side and the economic side. It can also, I, I would also like to see 
a, a longer term framework set up for response to pandemics. So not just solving this immediate problem, but we are not going, we are going to have more pandemics in future. And I think the WTO should get with other international organizations like the WHO, Gavi, CEPI, even the World Bank, IMF, and all those multilaterals to try to set the rules so that next time we don't spend time trying to figure out how to respond. It will just trigger a set of actions. Um, so, so, so that's really a top priority. Following that, I'd like us to work on the fisheries subsidies negotiations. I think there's a very strong chance to complete those, which have been going on for 20 years, and this is far too long. We need to be accountable to end these neg negotiations and end them well, because they are very important for the world. It, it means sustainability for our fisheries uh, in our oceans. So that's very, very important. I think third would then be uh, focusing on the, on the dispute settlement mechanism and trying to set forward a pathway, uh, a work program a set of reforms that can be agreed and pushed forward at MC12. So those are three top ones. Then let me uh, add that, uh, you know, the digital economy and the e-commerce negotiations are very dear to my heart. And the simple reason is that I just see the blossoming of mm. SMEs using online platforms to trade and to improve their lives. And so I want us to see, see if we can make progress in, in that area. Very good. The next question is for Christian Ulbrich from DPA. Christian, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Dr. Ngozi, and nice to see you, Keith. Thank you. Um, I had a very similar question, but I wonder whether you can take it one step further. What are the low hanging fruit on your 100 days agenda? Do you think we will be able to tick off one of the items on your very vast list of things that need to be done? I think By, so. in the next 100 days, sorry, thank you. Yes, no, I think the low hanging fruit is one, preparing a very successful MC12 that will come out with outcomes. And within that, uh, completing the fishery subsidies uh, you know, well, low hanging fruit may be a bit, uh, maybe, you know, people might say it's not as easy, but I do feel it's within reach for us to agree on that. Uh, another low hanging fruit uh, is, a, is a dealing with the pandemic. I think we can come to some agreements on that and, and take that off. Uh, the third one is agreeing the work program for solving the dispute settlement mechanism. I'm not saying solving it, just agreeing the work program. I think we can get to MC12 with a work program uh, that will work. And then there are a few other things like, can we get to agreement on exempting the World Food Program, for instance, from export restrictions so that humanitarian, uh, humanitarian endeavors of the WFP are not hampered? I think we can also push for that. So let me just stop there. I think those are four areas where I think we can get results. Okay, very good. Let's take another question from the floor. This one from Jeremy Lange of Radio France. Uh, Jeremy, vous avez la parole. Thank you, Keith. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Ngozi, uh, at the beginning of your statement, you, you were saying that it cannot be business as usual anymore. Uh, and I was wondering, do you think it can be business as usual regarding the environment as well? Uh, one of the critics uh, that is made towards the WTO is its lack of commitment uh, for fighting climate change. So I was wondering, uh, how will you make sure that the recovery will be uh, more sustainable after the pandemic? Yes, I think that's a really important uh, question. And I think, you know, we need to get back um, to some of the areas, you know, the re reviving negotiations on environmental, trading environmental goods and, 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 and services. And uh, um, trying to work with uh, poor countries in particular on the transition so that any money spent, uh, you know, will be used, as you said, to, to bring a uh, build back better, you know, and that involves aid in, you know, how do we green any assistance uh, to countries so that it's spent in a way that greens the, the country and greens the economy. I think that is one uh, uh, area we can quickly uh, take a look at. And then, you know, I think uh, uh, issues of 
the, the logistics of trade, I come back to that. How can we encourage low carbon emissions transportation of goods and services? We need to take a look at that, but also the issue of uh, high emitting, high carbon emitting goods themselves. Um, how do we look at the issue of carbon taxes? For instance, I've argued in the past that for, for many countries, this is also a source of revenue. So it shouldn't just be seen. I think you can make it more attractive to finance ministers by saying, look, this will kill two birds with one stone, particularly in developing countries. It will help you uh, discipline high carbon emissions, but also bring in revenues into, into the uh, exchequer, into the purse, if you will. So there are several actions um, that we need to look at that could be quite beneficial that um, I believe uh, uh, are good. And don't forget that the fishery subsidies is also about uh, sustainability and the environment. So if we deliver that, that's another thing that adds to the whole environmental area. But on climate change, I'm very keen. I just want to state that as we do this, we must make sure we don't come up with disciplines that make developing countries feel that barriers are, get, are being put against trade of their products. And I believe we can, uh, we can handle this in a way that doesn't do that. Okay, very good. Uh, I'd like to call now on John Zaracostas. John works for a number of different outlets, including um, The Lancet and France 24. John, you have the floor, please. Yes, uh, good evening, Dr. Ngozi. Good I would evening. like you to elaborate a little bit how do you think this licensing for vaccines and therapeutics and essential medicines can be done in a, a few short months through the WTO, given that in some licensing agreements, developing countries are ending up paying more than developed countries? Um, well, first of all, let me say that there sh under no circumstances should there be license licensing agreements that lead to developing countries paying more than developed countries. That is not at all uh, the point. The point of having this is that there should be volume, uh, you know, manufacturing in greater volume. So indeed it's more accessible and affordable. So um, any agreements that result in developing countries paying more, I think are not satisfactory. And we have to go back to the manufacturers of, of, uh, of those commodities to make sure that this is not the case and developing countries are not uh, a disadvantage. Now, you know, I, I'm not going to go really into the weeds. I, I see how AstraZeneca has been able to do this and is talking to many more countries in Latin America and Asia about uh, this licensing. Johnson and Johnson uh, is doing some contract manufacturing in South Africa, but has in a meeting I attended a couple of weeks, a week ago actually, they talked about also looking at licensing. So in this licensing, they are very aware that this is the objective is not to penalize poor countries by charging them more. No, it is to help them get access quicker. What we have in the world is an absolute uh, shortage of supply. And that is because the world has never manufactured for, let's take vaccines. It's never manufactured 7 billion doses of vaccines. I've been in the vaccines business with Gavi. You know, um, th this has never occurred. So there's a shortage of manufacturing capacity. And to the extent that these companies can uh, uh, work in developing countries where there are possibilities, many developing countries have said they have the space and the capacity, but they just want to come to agreement with these companies. And I think that that should be done and can be done at costs that are very affordable to developing countries. Thank you very much. Let's go to Brazil now. Um, Assis Moreira from Valor. And Assis's question is, what do you think can be achieved concerning agricultural subsidies during the next WTO ministerial conference? Um, thank you very much. Um, I talked a lot about innovation, innovative approaches and new rules and for the digital economy, the, the MS, MIS, MIS um, climate change. But I said we should not forget about agriculture. But in agriculture is a traditional area that is critically important actually. 
to many countries, both developed and developing, and many emerging markets, but very important to least developed countries. Um, but some of the issues in agriculture are quite thorny. They are not easy. You mentioned, uh, for instance, I think uh, the issue of domestic support uh, uh, and, and the mounting subsidies um, that, that are accruing under domestic support, that needs to be looked at. I think those are quite difficult issues that I, I'm not sure the ministerial would be the place. I'm looking at the ministerial, if we can, if we can start uh, thinking one of uh, some things that could be a win, like the export restriction, lifting that on food, because this is very important to many countries, especially small island economies and others, and there have been restrictions on food, uh, lifting the humanitarian restrictions for the WFP. These are uh, small areas in agriculture where we might get agreement at the MC12, but then we could look at a work program on some of the other issues. Um, you know, we have to look at issues of domestic support tied to market access. So it's not going to be an easy chapter. And I would see it uh, being settled beyond this ministerial. Very good. We'll stay in Latin America. And it's a question from Florencia Carboni of Trade News in Argentina. She says, uh, good afternoon and congratulations. What is the main value that your election brings to the WTO? Thank you for that question. I think the main values is, value is a fresh pair of eyes. Uh, someone who is different and, and someone who, who, who will not accept the way business has been done all the time. So I think it's a, a big advantage to come in fresh, uh, to come in, uh, as I said, with fresh eyes and fresh ears, because I think that's what's needed. Um, I think one has said that a definition of madness is doing the same thing you've done for years <laughs> and knocking yourself against the wall, doing the same things. So WTO cannot go on like that. It's too important an organization. And so bringing fresh energy, fresh vigor, seeing problems in a different light from the way they were seen and seeing solutions. More importantly, I think that's what I'm going to bring. And I really relish that challenge to try and bring a fresh perspective to solving problems. We've got time just for a couple of more. Here's a question from um, Robert Bodegraven of Groenlinks in the Netherlands. And Robert's question is, the European Commission seeks border adjustment measures for environmentally harmful goods and services, i.e. for carbon, to level the trade playing field. What is your view of these measures and how can the WTO help to harmonize climate-friendly border adjustment measures? Well, thank you. I think the issue of border adjustment measures uh, is coming down the pike from the EU, possibly from the EU, US and other members. I'm the, I was the co-chair of the Global Commission on Economy and Climate until a few days ago, co-chairing with Paul Pullman and uh, Lord Nicholas Stern. So these are issues very dear to my heart. And I think that measures that could help us lower carbon emissions uh, um, are very important to think about. So border adjustment taxes, we should reflect on them, uh, but they are not uh, very easy. Uh, issues of measurement, uh, um, how you set them, how you monitor them, these are all very practical uh, issues that we have to think about. And uh, making sure that they are applied in a way that is not discriminatory in any way to developing countries uh, with respect to their trade. I think uh, these are also issues we need to look at. But yes, are there possibilities to look at border adjustment taxes down the line? Yes, uh, um, um, we can do that, but we should look at, make sure they're applied and measured and monitored in a way that is very fair to all members and that does not cause uh, um, uh, some members to feel that they're being uh, somehow uh, harmed by such taxes. Very good. We have a question from Rotus Oduri from Arise News in Lagos. Rotus, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ungozi Okonjo-Wele, congratulations on your appointments as the new Director General of the World Trade Organization. My question for you is, in your acceptance speech, um, you said 
that transparency is the lifeblood of the team. And um, I wanted to ask how you intend to get member states to be more transparent uh, in their practices going forward under your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Uh, I meant it. And I think the way to do it is through stronger monitoring. I accept that the monitoring function of the WTO, the monitoring function of the secretariat could really be strengthened. Um, you know, when you, you uh, have a very strong monitoring function, then you're able to see what is going on uh, within the, 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 the membership. Uh, what are the policies that are being put in place? Uh, and, and uh, you know, how do they comply with WTO rules? Uh, and then also using technology. I hope we can continue. The WTO has been using technology to try and get members to put all their new trade rules and regulations and whatever they are doing, like all these export prohibitions and restrictions uh, using the technology. Now, some of the, um, uh, some of the members don't have the capacity some least developed countries have said to me that they lack the capacity and that's there we need to give them the help and support needed. But there are some members who have the capacity but are not doing it. They're not using these tools and they are not uh, putting out uh, what they are doing as transparently. There we have to speak with them to actually find out what is the issue and how can the secretariat be helpful in trying to get them to do this. So that monitoring function is exceptionally important for that. Dr. Ngozi, thank you very much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you once again for your patience in hanging in there with us. Thank you for attending, and I wish all of you a very nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. And Keith, thank you so much to you and your team for, for doing this. Thanks all. Bye. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks.